Good morning, everybody. Um, looks like most of us are here, so let's get started. Uh, today we'll be reviewing uh, a Duckless product, Duckless 101, so just a high-level overview, the do's, the don'ts, the proper tools to use, etc. Uh, Craig will be leading our discussion today again. Um, same ground, ground rules as all of the other presentations. If you have questions, feel free to use the chat or um, raise or lower your hand. And I will pass it over to Craig. Good morning, everybody. Uh, if you haven't met me, uh, my name is Craig Anderson. I work for Wolseley. I help out with the TSA program um, across Ontario, and um, we try to help out uh, Atlantic Canada as well. Uh, I'm the lead TSA for Ontario. Um, we have uh, two more TSAs that are full time. Um, Guy, um, St. Denis up north and uh, Steve Martindale uh, has just signed on to uh, take on a full time role in the GTA area. Uh, so we'll have uh, three full time um, technical service advisor for you uh, to get a hold of um, Monday to Friday. Uh, we're working on a fourth as well. Uh, to take care of another area for us. So um, we should be uh, well grounded for technical support um, for Ontario uh, in the, the next little bit. So today we're going to be going over some uh, ductless product, um, some installation, um, some stuff you should be looking at, some tools you should have. We're going to be about an hour. Uh, I'll try to make it not too boring. I know it's a PowerPoint presentation. We're not one-on-one -on -one any uh, at this point, but um, we'll be about 45 minutes to an hour. If there's any questions, you can um, just type them in or you can wait to the end and we can answer any questions for you too. So I always start off the presentations with this here. This is gokeepright.com. Um, if you haven't been on this site, go on the site, play around with it. We can get uh, specification, installation manuals, technical manuals, anything you want on a Keepright product. The site is is amazing. Um, this is where we go as uh, technical service advisors. If any of you guys call and you give us a model number, this is the site we go to. We get our technical manuals, our installation manuals. It's a great site to go to. Put it in your phone, your laptop, uh, have it at um, the office. Great site to go in and browse manuals. So when you pump that up, this is the page that it's going to look like. Uh, it's new if you haven't been on it for a while. This is the, the new look of it. Uh, but the same uh, properties inside what you need to do to get to it. So here's your big box right here is the Go Keep Right search box. The first four digits, five digits of the model number, no more than that. If you put more than that, then you're just going to get uh, no search found or anything. So just the first four or five digits of the model number, hit the search. It's going to pull you up the installation instructions, uh, owner's manual, uh, warranty certificate, uh, technical uh, manuals, anything you need. If we're going on a job site um, to a a mini split or an air conditioner that you didn't work on before, jump on the website for five minutes, just browse through the, the technical guide. It'll definitely help you when you get there. <clears throat> so ductless technology and principles, what is ductless? Well, ductless is a heating and cooling unit for uh, inside a house or apartment or uh, garage anytime. So. We have two primary systems. We have a single zone and we have a multi zone. So single zone, one head inside, one outdoor unit, multi zone. We could have up to five indoor heads and one outdoor unit. You'll notice in the picture here, this is a multi zone uh, unit. You'll notice on our units, we can isolate. We have isolation valves. Uh, so we have a main valve on top and each unit can be isolated at any time. So if you need to work on it as a zone B, you can actually turn it off. You don't have to shut down the whole system. You can just shut down that one zone, work on that unit, and then put it back into, into play. Or if you're going back to add on to a multi-zone unit, you do not have to take 
the whole system down. You can add on and do your vacuuming and your charging right by the the porch just for that head. So great little um, add on for our units outside. So this is what it's gonna look like when you're uh, getting your unit, whether it's a multi-zone or a single zone, you're gonna have an indoor head, you're gonna have the controller. The controller is gonna come in with the indoor head, uh, which will be in the bag with the, the manual. And then you're gonna have your outdoor unit. If we have a multi-zone unit, then we're gonna have a couple other boxes, but standard single zone. Uh, when you get to the job site, uh, you're gonna have two boxes. So like I said, uh, places you can put these, uh, sunrooms, bonus rooms, uh, you can put them in basements. If you're going to install it, just be uh, aware of where you're going to install it, uh, adjacent walls, uh, corners, um, stuff like that, high ceilings, um, just be mindful of where uh, you're going to be placing the indoor unit. So ductless technology and principles. So I'll just go over a couple uh, sensors that are in the unit that uh, you need to be mindful of uh, when you're in installing it and when it's it, when it's running. So the unit works on a bunch of different sensors. This is how a ductless system works. It takes algorithms and uh, temperatures uh, from sensors and makes the unit run. Uh, this is how it modulates up and down. So we have a return air temperature sensor. We have a coil temperature, uh, an outdoor condensing coil temperature, an outdoor air temperature, and a discharge air temperature. Multi-zones have a couple more sensors as we have a bunch of different zones that are on it. So evaporator suction temperature sensor. And we'll go over each one. Uh, so be mindful when you're installing this unit and you're taking the cover off and you're putting the cover on. So the return air temperature sensor is mounted on the inside coil. As it reads return air temperature sensor. So this is taking the temperature from the room, bringing it through the unit, telling the remote control um, I'm warm enough or I'm cold enough to keep operating or I need to shut down. So that temperature sensor, be mindful when you're installing the unit, it's not too tight to the ceiling uh, where it's bringing real hot air in. Uh, there's clearances to the ceiling, uh, adjacent walls as well. If your wall across from that unit is too close and you have a big unit, then you can have cycling of the air. So your return air temperature sensor is cycling the compressor on and off and then we get compressor failure. Before you put the cover on, make sure that sensor is in place and tight on the coil that it has not fallen off. If it's fallen off, then we could get a misreading as well. Evaporator thermistor. This is mounted on the, the side of the coil uh, on the indoor head. All this sensor is is a proving sensor. Uh, so it proves that the unit is turned on and we have gas going through the unit. So it's going to read the, the temperature of the coil to tell the outdoor unit what it needs to do uh, because our outdoor unit will be modulating. So this is going to modulate your EE valve outside to allow what percentage of Freon to bring into the indoor head. So be mindful of that one as well, that it's in place. If it is not in place, then we could be getting some error codes because it's not reading proper temperature. They just plug into the, the main board that's uh, in the indoor unit. Um, and you can't mix the plugs up, they're both different. Outdoor air thermistor. So this is just reading our outdoor air temperature. That is all it's doing. It's mounted on our outdoor uh, unit. So just be mindful of your clearances outside, not too close to the wall, not in the, try not to get it in the direct sunlight. It's all it's doing is reading the outdoor air temperature to help our, our unit when we're in heating or cooling mode. It will turn off the unit if the unit, um, it's too cold or it's too hot outside. Condensing coil thermistor, it's mounted on the outdoor unit uh, down in behind where the, the compressor is located. 
this sensor here is just telling our unit uh, what our coil temperature sensor is. So in our heating mode, if we have to go into a defrost, this sensor is just telling it to start your defrost or turn your defrost off. So if you're having problems with defrost or anything like that, it's a good sensor to take a peek at to make sure that it didn't fall off the coil at any point. They're usually on there pretty good, but uh, we have seen them fall off. Another sensor uh, just above around where the, the compressor is, is a discharge thermistor. This acts along with our low pressure switch because our units are modulating and they, they start off at such a low frequency and such a low pressure, we needed to add another sensor in there in case we have lost Freon. So it's like a loss of charge sensor, um, low pressure sensor works along with our low pressure. So we have to make sure that one, you can notice that they're on there pretty good. Um, they don't usually fall off, but just sensors to look at if you're getting some sensor error codes. So product overview for um, if you're gonna do a single zone or a multi-zone unit, uh, indoor equipment. So you have high wall head, cassettes, you have ducted units and you have four consoles. So any of these can be matched up with a, a multi-zone unit, or if we're doing a single zone, then you, you'd have just one cassette and one outdoor unit. They all come standard with uh, wireless remote controls. And we can add on wired controls um, to our units as well, uh, if need be. So depending on, um, what tier of unit uh, you're buying. Uh, so we call it entry tier, mid tier and high tier. So uh, the tier rating is um, the functionality of the unit. So if you're getting a high tier unit, so that unit there is probably gonna be able to operate down to minus 30. Uh, when you get into an entry tier, that unit there is probably only gonna um, operate to like minus 17. So different tiers to look at. So different remotes that you're gonna get with different uh, tiers. Functionality of their remotes, pretty much the same. Uh, what they can do, just the different buttons that are going to do different things for you. Also have out there too, if the person doesn't want a remote or is always uh, losing the remote and they decided that they wanna put a wired controller, uh, we can add a wired controller to most of our units. Um, so they had just have a standard uh, thermostat on the wall. 24 volt controller two is out there. You guys might run into this in installations. This is a controller that is added on to our ductless units um, via a aftermarket thermostat. So you can actually buy an ICP thermostat for that ductless unit or if the th person wants their uh, Ecobee or uh, Honeywell thermostat Wi-Fi that they like, they know how to run, they don't want to lear learn a new thermostat, we can add a new 24 volt controller box to it that will adapt their preferred thermostat to our ductless splits units. So this is what the, the box would look like. Uh, so we'd have an outdoor unit, uh, we'd have to feed into that box and then we'd have to go to the third party thermostat. As long as that thermostat uh, can take five wires as we need the common um, to operate, uh, we can add it onto our ductless units now. So this is what the wired uh, 24 volt controller would look like. Uh, you'll notice it has its computer board and on the computer board, this is where now where we're going to read the the error codes because the error codes are not going to be on the remote control anymore. Um, so we'd have to go down to that controller box to see what the error code is for that unit. <clears throat> so we'd wire into that unit out of it and to our thermostat. Uh, this box can be mounted outside as well uh, or inside, whatever you prefer. Kind of an idea of some error codes that you would uh, you would see on your controller, uh, E0, um, indoor EEPROM e error. So we're talking uh, 
uh, communication error um, for the indoor unit. Um, so these are the codes that it's nice to look at uh, before you go to a unit. The customer is going to tell you I'm getting an E1 code. Go to codekeepright.com, pull up the service manual, see what that error code is before you get there. So, you know, have an idea of what you're looking for. <clears throat> So you'll have error codes on the outdoor unit and you'll have error codes on the indoor unit. Uh, each one mean a different thing. So just be mindful when you're looking at error codes, both units have an error code. So functions of controls, uh, you're gonna be asked this, uh, you're installing the unit and you have to explain it to the customer. Like I said, both units, um, pretty much the same functionality of the buttons, uh, the remotes just look different. Uh, on and off buttons, up and down, your fan button, swing, uh, setting the thermostat. Um, you can lock the thermostat and we'll go through a bunch of the settings of what they mean. So functions and controls, uh, our units are equipped with a self-clean mode. So the self-clean function enables the drying of the indoor coil after after a cool or dry mode. So once the unit is shut off in the cool mode or the dry mode, the coil is always a little bit most uh, moist. So under this function, the air conditioner automatically cleans and dries the evaporator. So it actually turns and reverses the Freon flow through that coil to heat that coil up to dry it. Uh, so we're not getting that damp, moist, on the coil all the time. It will actually dry the coil and then get ready and go back into the, the cooling uh, mode. So very nice function just for uh, uh, mold and growth that's going on the coil. Um, we still suggest that the coils be cleaned and stuff like that, but this is just helping out the coil, uh, keep it a little cleaner. Do not disturb mode. Um, the silent mode functions um, sets the compressor at a, a very low operation. So once they put it into a silent mode or do not disturb mode, it puts the frequency of your compressor and your, your cooling down to a very minimal. So if the person's in an office or a bedroom and the fan noise is bugging them, they can put this do not disturb or silent function on and it will bring the unit down to a very low frequency and a very low cooling operation. It's great for if you're, you're in an office or in your bedroom, but you might experience uh, low cooling. It's not gonna have the, the RPMs and everything to heat and cool the space in a normal time where it's really hot or really cold. Um, so you have to be very mindful of that function. So to initiate this function, we need to hold um, hold down the button for two seconds to activate the silent mode. So putting it in silent mode, you're activating it. You have to manually go back and take it out of silent mode the same way we put it in, uh, or it will just stay in silent mode. So just be mindful of that to the customers. If they do use the silent mode, they have to take it out of the silent mode as well for normal operation. So LED button on your, your, your function of control, we get a lot of calls on this. Um, the indoor had the light went out. Um, what do we do? Uh, I can't get it back on. Chances are the customer hit the little LED button. We can turn the, the light off on the, the head that's on the top. You can turn it on, you can turn it off. Some people turn it off, it's in the bedroom, it's glowing, it's bothering them or they're sitting across from it and they see this light all the time, you can actually physically turn it off or turn it on. So if you get a call or you're having a problem, uh, the, I can't get the, the display to come up, it could be just the light off. <clears throat> turbo mode, um, turbo mode is just what it means. Um, it, it'll put the air conditioning or the heating into the highest speed possible um, that it can perform to heat or cool that space quickly. So if you're in a meeting room or you're having a party and 
the air conditioning you don't find is keeping up or you're getting ready for it, you're just getting uh, started, you want to heat and cool the space that's in there, you can put it in this turbo mode. It will turn it in heating or cooling the highest speed possible and it'll run for 30 minutes. Um, if it heats or cools the space before that 30 minutes, then it'll go into normal operation. But it will run for 30 minutes to try to heat or cool that space. After the 30 minutes, it'll just jump back into normal operation. So if you need some more, you can flick the turbo back on again, but it will time out after 30 minutes. So a nice little option for somebody's having a party and stuff like that, and uh, they can flick it into turbo mode, heat or cool the space quickly, and then uh, move on with their, their party or their meeting or whatever they have to do. Uh, follow me mode. So this uh, mode will, uh, it's on your remote control. So what this does to our remote control is makes our remote control our thermostat. Um, we have our return air temperature sensor that is in our indoor head. Um, depending on where that indoor head is mounted, it could be mounted up high uh, or in a different location. And the person's feeling that that sensor is not keeping it to where they want. So what they can do is put on the remote control is on the following mode, which is going to turn this remote control into their thermostat and heat and cool the space by the thermostat or by the remote control, sorry. So when they're in the following mode, this remote needs to see the unit. So every seven minutes, our remote control looks for the indoor head. If within that seven minutes, it does not locate the indoor head, then it's going to revert back to the indoor sensor. So we could have some uh, temperature swings at this point. If the customer takes the remote and throws it in a drawer or puts it in another room and it doesn't read that temperature, it's going to go back and revert back to the, the indoor head sensor so be mindful if the people are going to use that mode explain that to them remote control needs to see the indoor unit or it'll bounce back and forth <clears throat> freeze protection uh this freeze protection enables the system to operate at a high enough temperature to protect the coil during colder temperatures we're just talking about uh is only available in the heating mode. So it's just keeping the coil temperatures inside and outside a, a perfect temperature so the unit doesn't freeze. Um, just a nice little feature for the, the unit's uh, coils. Emergency mode. So this emergency mode is uh, activated by the indoor head. So the emergency mode is if the dog ate the remote or the batteries died or they just lost the remote, it's gonna allow us to do emergency operation. So when you lift the cover on the indoor unit, there'll be a little bit hole, a little hole on the right hand side that you can put a, a little pencil uh, through that hole and hit the button. So what this that'll do will activate the unit to operate. Um, it's going to use the internal algorithm. We won't be, not be able to set any temperatures. It will just give them some AC or some heating during that moment of time um, till they get new batteries or get a new remote. So a nice little function. You can test the unit too. If the unit is not operating with the remote, something's going on. You think it's the remote, not quite sure. You can go to the unit, press the emergency button. That'll eliminate our remote control. The unit operates, then we know, hey, we got we have a problem with our remote control, whether it's batteries or we need a new one. So a nice little mo uh, option for you um, if we lose the remote control and stuff. So installation, so this is the biggest thing uh, on any job site. If we install it correctly, then chances are it's gonna run for a long time. 
Um, we're dealing with different freons now than we used to deal with a long time ago. Um, they're, they're mixed gases. Um, we need to get moisture out of it. So installation on any AC system uh, is very critical. So installation, um, you're gonna get your installation manual in every unit. Good thing to just breeze through it. Things change. Um, different units have different clearances, um, stuff like that, um, where we want it in a corner or how far we need it away from the ceiling. Always nice just to breeze through the installation instructions before you, uh, I'm not saying read it, uh, end to end a uh, good idea to read it end to end but nice just to breeze through it before installing it just in case we're missing something so things we need to look at uh we're planning your installation unit placement like i said uh is there a wall across from it really close uh, is it in a corner um too high to the ceiling so unit placement does come into consideration on these units where you're going to run the electrical power sizing and connections of the copper. Um, we always go by the indoor unit with the copper size is If there's any reducing needed to be done. We always do it on the outdoor unit. So sizing and connection refrigeration piping where you're going to drain this. They have drains on them and you got to think about where it's located. So the next guy or if it's yourself installing and servicing it, you want to make sure that uh, you're putting it in a good spot that you can get to it and service it properly. General considerations, electrical power, make sure you're following all the codes and um, what the manual is telling you to do and what kind of wire uh, you're using. Service and maintenance and clearances like we talked about, make sure you're putting it in a good spot where you can, you can get to it, you can service it. Um, you can get to the drain to, if it needs to be cleaned out. So just be mindful of that. <laughs> so installation of a ducted unit. So a ducted unit, <clears throat> you'll see them in server rooms and stuff like that. Uh, they, they mount from the ceiling. So stuff that you're going to need um, that doesn't come with it is uh, threaded rod, <clears throat> lock washers, uh, flat washers. Um, we want to double nut it as well. So the units are equipped with mounting brackets on the ducted unit. And then you'll notice in the diagram when we go through the bracket on the ducted unit, what we want to do is we want to double nut it and nut on the top and a nut on the bottom, two washers, and we want to tighten that. The units do vibrate a little bit, so double nutting it is just helping us know that any vibration, we're, we're supporting it properly. So these units here, uh, our ducted units have a, a drain in them. <clears throat> so they have a gravity drain, plus they have a, a lift pump that's inside. So if we need to go up and over some rafters and then go back down to a drain, we can, we can hook it up to the condensate pump that's in the unit. Uh, it will pump up to about 32 inches. Always try not to max out whatever uh, it tells you it can do. Uh, it's like a furnace, it can vent 60 feet. Let's not bring it to 60 feet. So let's always keep it a little bit under what the, the manual actually says. So the units are equipped with a little gray connection hose and a clamp, um, which we clamp onto the ducted unit and it will transfer you to three quarter inch PVC to do your drain. Like any other drain, uh, we want a good slope so it's draining properly. Uh, we don't want things to double trap um, that just causes backup. So always make sure that your drain is uh, sloping and not double trapped. And we're always using three quarter. Um, you, you'll see a lot of units that come out with half inch, always adapt to three quarter. Um, it just clogs up a lot less. So electrical power. Uh, 
electrical power in the area for our ducted units, um, like any mini split um, or ducted unit or ceiling cassette, um, we have communication wires that are in there. So be mindful if you're in computer rooms or around TV wiring, uh, radio wiring, anything like that, that you're keeping your distance from that. Or if you have a lot of that, um, if you're installing it, you might say, hey, listen, I'm in a computer room. I got a lot of stuff going on. I might want to put a shielded wire in. So be very mindful of your surroundings and, and where you're running your wire. So for our wiring, uh, we'd like a 14 gauge stranded wire um, to make the electrical connection between the indoor and the outdoor unit. Uh, we're asking for stranded wire. It brings uh, better communication through the stranded wire. Um, we're dealing with uh, L1, L2, S, and ground. Um, most of the stores have the special wire for ducted units. Uh, it's all ready to go. So L1, L2 is our power, S is our signal. L2 is actually our signal as well. So we have to be very mindful of our wiring. Uh, L1 goes to L1, L2 goes to L2, S goes to S. If you're hooking your unit up and you're getting a communication error code, chances are your wire is backwards. Or if you had an electrician wire your unit, L1, L2 don't means power to them. Um, with our units, L2 is actually a signal wire as well, so they need to match up. It's not like a standard two, 220. It doesn't matter on a 220 that your wires are backwards. It does on these units. We're using the L2 as a signal. So better be very mindful of hooking when you're hooking up your wires. <clears throat> 14 gauge stranded wire. A uh, couple pictures we always like to throw in there. This is a ducted unit. Um, it looks like they've hooked up flex to it and used the whole box of flex to run through. So be mindful when you're uh, using these ducted units that somebody's actually did a duct calculation. They're, they're not to heat or cool massive areas. Um, so the duct work that goes on these um, can't be a lot. So you just uh, make sure that you're looking at the specs and using a duct calculator to size up your stuff. So installation of wall mounted unit. <clears throat> Same thing as your ducted unit. Uh, find a place, uh, a good wall, solid wall. Um, the wall is not bowed out uh, where you're putting the plate on the wall. Um, looking for the location of where your, your air is coming up, not an adjacent wall, um, stuff like that. Um, it's not over a cabinet, so the, the, when the air is blowing, it's just hitting the cabinet and bouncing around. Um, so be very mindful of where you're putting these units. We get a lot of calls on units, um, erratic um, behavior. Um, they're not running properly. Well, the wall across from it is six feet away. It's a two ton unit. It's blowing against that wall and it's coming back in. It's playing around with our return air temperature sensor. Um, convenience stores, we've seen them in that. People are mounting them in a convenience store and putting them over the coolers. It, the hot air from the compressors are just playing around with our sensors in the, in the mini splits. So be very mindful of where you're gonna put this unit. Uh, so we're going to mount the, the indoor plate to the wall. Um, make sure that you're you're finding a stud to mount this plate to the wall. That the unit is not super heavy, but uh, let's make sure it's not going to fall off the wall. Uh, make sure it's level when you put it on the wall. Um, make sure there's no bows in the wall so that plate is not bowing. So when you clip it on the wall, that it is not bowing the unit. Uh, you start bowing the unit, we start getting some weird noises coming out of the unit. <clears throat> uh, screw the mounting plate to the wall, make sure it's solid. On these units here, you can take the um, piping out the back, out each side, or you can bring it out the bottom just by swinging the lines to where the location um, you're going. Uh, be mindful that your drain is in that area too. So if you're going through the back wall, make sure that your drain is running on the back of the bottom of the copper 
uh, when it's running through that wall. If it's going out that wall and it's in between or if it's on top, chances are you're going to get some water inside the house. So make sure you're getting a good slope on that drain. <laughs> so a good idea is when you mount your plate and you're drilling your pilot hole from uh, inside to outside so you know where your lines are going. So you're dr drilling that center pilot hole uh, inside, then drill your, uh, your hole for your piping, then you're going outside. So wherever your pilot hole is outside, use that as the top of your hole outside now. That way there you know when you run those pipes through that wall, you're actually going down about an inch or so. Great way to know that you have slope going through that wall. We all know drilling a pilot hole, it could go up a little bit, it could go down a little bit. This way here, we know that we're getting that slope going through the wall. <clears throat> and always make sure that drain is on the bottom. So once we mount the plate, um, we're ready to go. Uh, we're going to mount the, the indoor unit. We have our hole drilled. Pretty simple. Uh, you take the pipes, uh, wrap them up a little bit, make sure your drain is on the bottom. Slide it through the hole. You're going to clip the top of the unit first, and then you're going to push it down and clip it into the bottom of the unit. And then we're going to get ready to go to install our outdoor unit. To undo it, uh, slightly raise the unit vertical, unclip it, and then you can take the unit off again. <clears throat> Installation of a cassette unit. So similar to your ducted unit, uh, it does have mounting brackets on it that we use threaded rod and we screw it to the ceiling or whatever we have up on top. Just setting it in a standard T-bar ceiling is not sufficient. We need to mount it to something above. So same as the ducted unit, uh, you're going to need threaded rods, you're going to need washers. Uh, we want it double nutted just to secure that unit, make sure it's level and all that stuff. <clears throat> so you'll notice uh, the back picture. Um, this picture here um, is our cassette unit. So when you're getting a cassette unit, it comes in two pieces. Um, you're gonna have the, the indoor piece. And then as you see in this picture here, it has the, the cover plate on it. It will not operate unless that cover plate on it is on. It has the, the mind for the unit. It plugs into this and makes sure everything operates. So stand here, you're gonna mount it into the ceiling. You're gonna get it ready, uh, pipe all your stuff that you need to pipe to it then you're going to put your face cover on and then you're going to uh, get it up and running. So similar to the ducted units, uh, this unit has a condensate pump in it as well. It does not have a gravity drain in it, only a condensate pump. So works same as your ducted unit. Uh, we can pump it up to about 32 inches, 30, 32 inches. Like I said, um, if you don't have to max it out, don't max it out. And then once you pump it up, then bring it down to a gravity drain with some good slope. So this gives you an idea of what you would be looking at uh, in the condensate pump. So the condensate pump is going to be uh, mounted inside the unit. And we're going to pump it up. And then once we pump it up to where we want to pump it up, then we're going to gravity drain back down. Uh, like I said, if you're doing this type of operation on the drain line, use solid line, uh, three quarter inch PVC, uh, get away from clear tubing. It kinks, it sags, it could run into a lot of problems down the road. Throw some solid three quarter inch PVC in there and you're laughing. So electrical power, exact same thing. 14-3 uh, stranded wire uh, to the indoor and outdoor unit, being mindful your L1, your L2, and your S uh, match up indoor and outdoor. Um, we're staying away from a lot of high voltage wiring, a lot of other signal wiring. And if you run into that, use the shielded wire. 
So installation of an outdoor unit. Always make sure that your proper clearances are made uh, for the intake and uh, the outtake of the, the fan motor. Uh, make sure it's not too close to the wall, uh, shrubs being close to it where it's blowing out or sucking in. Look in the manual, see what the recommendations for the clearances is, are. Um, if you have multiple units, uh, make sure you got the clearances and separation of how they want them um, mounted outside. Uh, shrubs, walls, um, can I get hit by a car, stuff like that. So if you guys are the ones installing it, then be mindful. Um, the salesman could say, oh, yeah, yeah, we could put it here. You guys are installing it. This is your work. Uh, just be mindful of where you're going to be putting it. So like I said, uh, the books will tell you the clearances uh, side to side. Uh, the top we need access to to get to our computer boards. Uh, the one side we need to get to our service valve and our electrical connections. Then the other sides we need clearances for our airflows. So be mindful of your clearances. Uh, more the better, um, especially if you're going to go back and you think um, you want a little bit more room when you're servicing it. We've all got to that air conditioner that they have four inches away from the wall. You can't even get a screwdriver in there to get the 516 screw off. Be mindful of where we're putting it. Uh, so let's set the unit up on the wall. Uh, make sure that when we're mounting it up on the wall, if we're dealing with a heat pump, get it up off the ground. These units run in the winter time. Uh, they will defrost. They need the clearances up off the ground to stay out of the snow. And when it does defrost, it's defrosting properly. If it's sitting on the ground, all it's going to do is freeze to the ground. And trust me, we've seen it. Um, down in North Bay area, there is 16 heat pumps that the guy put them on the ground. They're all frozen to the ground. So be mindful, heat pumps, keep it up off the ground. Uh, 18 inches, uh, snow stands, wall brackets, uh, just be mindful where you're putting this baby. So we'd like to show you uh, a nice install. This one's fantastic. Uh, we got our clearances up off the ground. Uh, our electrical connection is out there. Looks like we have a, a disconnect and it looks like maybe we have a surge protector out there as well. Another thing to be mindful if you're talking to your salesman or if you guys are the salesman, the installer, the service guy, um, we're, we're seeing a lot of surge surging nowadays in, in the industry. Uh, we're dealing with modulating units. We're, we're dealing with uh, DC units. Um, Compressors um, are dropping out. We're getting power surges to these houses or if we're dealing with a, a commercial building, uh, the power fluctuation is outrageous or a old farmhouse where they have 20 poles going to the house. What they do is they, they crank up the, the power at the road. So by the time it gets to the house, it's cleared. So a good idea if you're, you're doing an install, um, Price in a power surge protector, it saves your outdoor unit. <clears throat> so on this unit as well, we got our clearances to our wall. Uh, you'll notice a nice wall bracket that it's on there. If you guys never use one of these, they're a little bit more money, uh, but they're fantastic. Um, they'll do pretty much any size of outdoor unit that you have. All you do is mount your, your bracket on the top and then these things clip in. So these are adjustable back and forth to where your legs are on the unit. Um, you're not trying to deal with two, two angle irons, getting them level and stuff like that. Very nice setup for um, mini split wall units. Torque wrenches, uh, we're dealing with flare nuts um, and most mini splits are flare nuts. Uh, they don't like welding in the line. Uh, which we'll go through. But torque wrenches, uh, it's in the manual what each flare nut needs to be torqued down to. 
we want to make sure that we got a good flare. We're torquing the flare nut. We're not going to get a bigger wrench to tighten it because it's leaking. If you're putting that much force on a flare nut, the flare nut is not done properly. Uh, it's cracked or it's mushroomed. Um, a bigger wrench is not going to fix your problem. Um, Teflon tape, um, leak seal, any of that is not going to fix your problem as well. It's going to cause problems because it's going to can't contaminate your, your pipes inside if it gets inside the line. Um, so make sure you're torquing the unit down, uh, two wrenches, one on each side. Other things to look at, uh, many splits, we don't want things added onto it like uh, old AC units. Uh, we don't want dryers, sight glasses, solenoid valves. Anything that's needed in the unit is in the unit. <clears throat> um, these things tend to slow down the flow of the Freon. And because our units are modulating and they modulate so low, this can slow down the flow of the gas even more and just do some abnormal operation of our units. So don't add anything into the unit. The only thing is really accepted is if you actually want to put a ball valve in the line to isolate a line for some reason, uh, a ball valve will open fully completely. Um, so that's acceptable. Uh, anything else, we do not want it added into the line. So connecting our piping, like I said, uh, we're dealing with uh, flare flaring. You want to make sure you got the proper flaring tools. Um, there's different flaring tools out there that will not give you a 45 degree flare. Make sure your flaring tools are rated for 410A, which is a 45 degree flare. Uh, make sure they're not worn out. Uh, they're doing a good flare. Um, make sure your flare is not cracked. Uh, make sure you put the flare nut on first before you do the flare or you're going to cut the line. Trust me, we've all done it. <clears throat> uh, make sure it's clean, uh, ready to go. Two wrenches. Always support the end of your, your fitting uh, when you're cranking it on. Use a torque wrench. Don't go get a bigger wrench because it's leaking. Vacuum test, uh, another big one that um, we all know uh, a lot of people do not do it properly. We call it a triple evacuation. What we want to do is we want to get the moisture out of the system. This is helping us get the moisture out of the system. So what we want to do is we want to put it on vacuum. We want to bring it down to 1500 microns, hold it at 1500 microns. Uh, if it holds at 1500 microns, um, turn it off, throw some dry nitrogen through it. We're drying the line a little bit more. <clears throat> throw the vacuum back on and again, bring it down to a thousand microns. <clears throat> Break that vacuum again, throw some nitrogen through it, drying it a little bit more, then throwing your vacuum on it to bring it down to the final vacuum. Uh, we wanna bring it under 500 microns and we wanna hold it at under 500 microns. So what I mean by hold it, when you turn your gauges off, and your vacuum off, your micron gauge is going to creep up. We're on a new install. You're gonna look at your micron gauge. It's gonna go down to 78 very easily. But when you turn it off, it creeps up. So creeping it up is telling us that, okay, we have moisture in the line or we have a leak. So it's going to creep up to a certain level and it's gonna sustain there. So we wanna make sure it's staying under 500 and holding there and not creeping up. So once it stops, don't just turn everything off and get going, let it sit. Let's see if it moves. It needs to hold there, it needs to hold that pressure. If it's not holding that pressure, then you have moisture in it or uh, you have a leak in it. Uh, high, big high vacuums, uh, 12 CFMs are vacuums that uh, are big commercial units. Um, we're drawing a vacuum quickly. We don't want to draw the vacuum too quickly. If you're drawing a vacuum too quickly, you can actually freeze the moisture that's in the line. <clears throat> so when you turn it back on and everything goes, then that moisture gets back in our Freon. So the three-step evacuation is making sure that the inside of our lines are perfectly dry. 
If we have moisture in there, we get erratic behavior of our operation and chances are that compressor is gonna fail at some point. <clears throat> so be very mindful of your, your vacuum. Uh, charging, uh, another big thing. Uh, all of the service guys hate us when they call us. Uh, we tell them to dump the charge. Uh, we're dealing with uh, 410A. Uh, it's a mixture of gas. Um, when we're charging a unit, we always want to charge it with liquid, freon, not vapor, uh, because it's a mixture of gas. If we're charging it with liquid, we know the mixture is there. If we're charging it with vapor, we don't know what mixture we're putting it in. We're dealing with modulating compressors. Um, on higher end um, AC units and many splits. Putting our gauges on these units is only telling us that we have gas in the unit and the unit compressor is pumping. We have no idea what stage that unit is in because it's modulating. So checking your pressures are nil and gone at this point. Unless you physically know 100% that that unit is in high operation, 100%, then we can start looking at our gauges to um, see what our pressures are. Other than that, we're dealing with the weigh-in method. So when in doubt, take the gas out, weigh the proper gas in. If you weigh the proper gas in, that takes it out of the equation. 100%, you know you have the right amount of gas in it, something else is going on. So always weigh it in. Um, your line's too long, look at your chart, see what your chart says the unit is charged for, weigh the extra gas in. Adding it in like the old days with R22, give it a little turn and wait is, is nil and gone nowadays because the way our compressors operate. <clears throat> So system test, uh, we're going to test for leaks. Uh, we're going to make sure everything's insulated. Um, pipes going through from indoor to outdoor are sealed uh, on our high wall unit, so we're not getting air filtration in the back of the unit. Uh, everything's firm. Uh, wiring is done. You have double check your L2, your L1, your S. They all match up indoor, outdoor unit. Condensate drain is hooked up. Grounds are secure. Grounding is another thing. Um, when you're checking your power, always check your power to ground. Always check your power to neutral. If you got a neutral out there, make sure they're the same. So wiring, um, we, we, we harp on this all the time. 14.3 uh, stranded wire, uh, indoor, outdoor unit. Uh, we don't want any connections uh solid wire uh, we want to keep it away from any radio tv antennas uh big high voltage wire it's not like the old days uh we took the low voltage wire the the pipes and the high voltage and we take them all together going in the house uh, we're dealing with communicating cating units now so we want to keep that wire away from the high voltage and if need be we use stranded idea of what the wire looks like. Um, we sell it at the shop by the roll. Um, it's black, it has your four wires that you, you require inside. Um, so make sure you're using the proper wire or your electrician is using the proper wire. So here's some pictures of uh, some units that we installed. We've seen this one earlier with the ducted unit. They use the whole box of flex to go to some of the connections. Um, just make sure the, the ductwork is proper. Uh, welding as well. Um, make sure you're doing your welding properly. Um, there's heat block that's out there. You can put around your service valves if you need to do any welding. Uh, make sure you're putting nitrogen through the lines. Uh, there's screens in these units. Uh, we want to make sure that we're cleaning the lines while we're welding them so we're not getting built up inside the units. Um, as I said, L1, L2, and S are signal wires and power wires. So be mindful of when hooking them up that your your S1 is on, you're not on your L1 um, sort of thing. That would mean we're giving 120 volts to our signal line and we could blow a board. 
Uh, so be mindful when hooking that up. Here's a no-no. Uh, like I said, leak lock on the service valves. Uh, that leak lock gets in the service valves, gets into the system, and blocks the screens that are in the reversing valves and in the EE valves. If a unit comes back for warranty and it has leak lock on it, it will be shot down. Uh, you will not get warranty on that outdoor unit. If you're going to service an outdoor unit and you're seeing leak lock on it, then you need to be very mindful. You could have erratic behavior of this unit because the screens inside are locked. Other, uh, like I said, clearances, uh, you'll notice these units, uh, the engineer designed them to uh, sit nice in a row and on top of the roof. Uh, a lot of these units are blowing into each other. Uh, so overheating, the, the one on the end might be okay, but the, the one on the far end might be overheating because they're all blowing into each other. So be mindful of your clearances. This is a ducted unit. Um, this is a uh, happened in the States from what I'm told. And there was, I think they said 11 of them. Um, like I said, the ducted units hang from uh, brackets that are mounted on the side of the unit. Um, they took them out of the box and they thought the brackets were to screw to the floor. So they screwed all 11 to the floor uh, through those brackets and hooked everything up. Once they turned them on, uh, every one of them went into an error code. Uh, which was um, condensate pump failure. Um, the pump was failed because the pump was upside down and the float was uh, hitting the floor now. Um, so they mounted them all upside down. So be mindful, like I said, read the instructions before. If you haven't installed something, read them um, before you install it. Uh, this guy had to go back and pump every unit down, flip them around and uh, start all over. He wasn't very happy, I guess. Uh, here's another one, uh, had a wiring problem um, <clears throat> and blew the board. So be mindful of your wiring. So startup, we're all ready to go. We have it installed. Uh, you're ready to flick the power. You know your L1, your L2 and your S are, are wired properly indoor and out. Uh, you have the right power going to the unit. Uh, whether it's 220 or 110, some of the smaller units are 110. So be mindful if you're doing a, a 9 and a or a 12, you can get them 115 volts. If you put 220 to them, they look like that board that you've seen in the last picture. Um, so be very mindful of your power. So once you turn the power on and you go outside and you put your disconnect in, you're going to hear a whole bunch of clicking. That's just everything talking to each other and powering up and getting ready to go. So now we want to check our power on our L1, L2. We want to make sure that where our power is into the unit is coming in properly. So these units are ready and to go. They will not operate if they're out of the parameter. 187 to 253. If the power is out of that parameter, the unit will not operate. It will shut down. So it's a little safety feature that is in there, but it's still nice to have a little surge protector that's on that unit just in case we're getting some spiking while the unit is running. <clears throat> so if the unit is running at uh, 248 and all of a sudden we get a spike, the unit will turn off, but hey, it might not turn off quick enough to stop it from hurting it. So be mindful of your power um, and don't just check, check the power. I got 220 and away you go. Turn the unit on, hold it there for a minute. Let's see if we are getting any fluctuation. So you've got the charge in your unit, you've weighed it in, you got the power on, we've got the unit running. Like I said, you can't check the pressures because we do not know what stage this unit is running. So the best way to do it, a couple pocket thermometers. If you're in the cooling and your temperature difference between your return and your supply is between 20 and 30 degrees, your charge is correct. If you're in your heating between 30 and 40 degrees, your charge is correct. So this is how we're checking the charge with the temperature differential coming in and out of that unit. Like I said, pressures are nil and gone. 
if you've weighed it in, everything should be hunky dory. So test the unit in both heating and cooling before you leave the house just to make sure everything works. Um, <clears throat> check your temperature differential. Show them how to use the, the remote control. If you did the installation properly, you did your vacuum properly, chances are that unit's going to run for a long time. And that's all I have today for you, gentlemen. Craig, there's a question in the um, chat. Someone has hey. asked, someone asked, what is that small box under the disconnect? Uh, that's a surge protector. So they have the, the power going into unit and then under the disconnect, they, what they've done is they put a surge protector that we were talking about if there's any power fluctuations. So that's an add on to the outdoor of the unit. Awesome. Is there any other questions for Craig today? Okay, so this concludes today's session. Uh, we will be doing the ductless service, so it's not the same as today. Um, it will be um, service at 1 p.m. And it looks like there's another question from Mike. Is the Delta C or F? That would be our, uh, that would be, uh, I'm going to say F. Yeah. So Fahrenheit. Uh, got it. Perfect. Okay. So that's everything for today. Thank you guys for attending. We'll hopefully we'll see you um, this afternoon at one. If not, we'll see you on probably some of the other sessions. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks everybody.